Absolutely. Yeah, welcome everyone um, to today's webinar. And uh, we would like to talk a little bit more about uh, leveraging virtual shopper insights for optimizing price pack architecture, so specifically PPA. And um, with me today, a very familiar face, um, Ingo Reinhardt, our co-founder and MD, and myself, Mario. I'm um, happy to present you some insights today. I think to just to kick things off, um, we have a little poll. So please tell us where you come from today, where you're dialing in from. Um, always love to see a international crowd here, international attendance, and getting first ones in here from Cologne, Germany, well, South Africa, Toronto, nice, Spain, another one from Toronto, USA. Awesome. Italy as well. Cool. Very good. Switzerland. Nice. Very international presence. Love to see that. Um, yeah, and as I said, I think we have a very relevant topic today on, on PPA. Briefly on myself. So I said, I'm Mario, um, Director of Customer Success at Binomics. Um, worked in pricing RGM for the past couple of years. And I'm leading our, our customer success team uh, that's dealing mostly with our existing customers, um, supporting and advising there. And with me today, um, Ingo Reinhardt, I think most of you already know him, um, more than 15 years of experience pricing RGM, um, our co-founder and MD, and he developed the Binomics method of virtual shopper technology. And we're very much looking forward to hear a lot about the insights that you're sharing today, Ingo. And just to kick things off, super briefly on Binomics, who are we? We are, for those who don't know yet, um, we're basically empowering better pricing and RGM decisions via a SaaS software approach um, where we're leveraging um, a holistic approach uh, covering all RGM levers, pricing, promotions, PPA specifically. Um, and we're doing that with best in class predictive accuracy up to 95% in our forecasting, reducing the speed to insight by roughly 70 to 90%, which then ultimately in combinations typically leads to higher profitabilities. And yeah, we have a lot of very interesting topics to cover. So I would say, Without further ado, let's get things started and kick it off. Ingo, please. Yeah, thanks, Mario, for the introduction and thanks everyone for, for joining today. Um, we want to talk about price pack architecture today. I think a topic that we haven't talked about in, in a long time. And it's, um, I think, something that, that's really important at the moment um, just to, to justify this. We um, just Googled a bit on, on uh, diff different uh, newspapers that are available in, on the field. And if you do the exercise, you, you actually find quite a lot that, um, for example, in Financial Times just recently, one or two weeks ago, spoke about uh, the increasing uh, mentioning of price pick architecture in um, um, among uh, at, at the sea level, so in, in quarterly earnings reports, it's, it's coming up quite a bit. And the reason I think for this is, as many of us know, obviously, is that um, in the past we've had substantial uh, inflation in the last year or the last two years. Um, many products have become much more expensive, and um, with this, um, price sensitivity among customers has been increasing. And the question now. Um, that many of us are facing is, does it make sense to further increase prices if costs increase, or does it make more sense to um, maybe reduce pack sizes or change the pack um, size structure overall, maybe go from three packages to uh, three pack sizes to four pack sizes, or from four pack sizes to three pack sizes. So those are all um, decisions that are becoming much more important. And I think the, the second trend next to the inflation um, and it effects on 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 um, price sensitivity among shoppers. The other effect that's that um, is becoming more and more relevant is with the emergence of AI technologies, machine learning, and so on. 
uh, we're seeing particular in what we are doing, but also uh, in our discussions with others, that um, AI um, provides many opportunities that haven't been available before. Uh, and um, that allows teams to look at a broader range of alternatives. Uh, that's something we do quite a lot with our customers. So they can look at more alternatives. They can look at more um, options on how to, to react to cost changes, for example, not just price changes, but also price changes in combination with price uh, price pack architecture changes and so on. So there are more options available and um, that's something where everyone can see in the news. And it's something that we are also seeing in our daily work uh, with our clients. And I think this leads us to the next question, Mario. Yeah, so just also to, to involve everyone a little bit here, we were wondering whether compared to previous years, um, if, if price pack architecture, so PPA, has gained more relevance for your RGM decision making? Is it something that is popping up more frequently for you now than it has been past years um, and, and historically? I think we have a poll here up and feel free to vote and let us know whether it's relevant, more relevant, equally relevant as before. Super keen to see the results. Mario, can you actually see the results or? Um, I don't think we are at 69%. Um, okay. Give it 10 more seconds. So everybody wants to vote can vote now. And then we share the results with you guys. Okay, I end the poll and share the results. Nice. Mario, what do you think? Yeah, I think that resonates very well with what we've also heard from, from our customers. Um, we have a combined almost 80% that say it's either much more relevant or more relevant compared to previous years, um, which is very impressive. But I think that's pretty much also the voice that we're hearing from the industry. Um, so even better that we have a webinar today on this and we're going to dive into more details. All right. Um, I think that's a good motivation. So it's become more relevant. So I think we're on the right track here. Um, I clicked it away. My, you don't see it anymore. I don't see it anymore. Okay, perfect. All right. So before we, we get into the detail, maybe let's take half a step back um, and just look at how price pack architectures integrated into the broader RGM field at the different levers we're, we're working with. Price pack architecture is, of course, um, one of the key levers to play with, but it's, of course, not the only one. As we all know, it um, comes along with the, the prices, the end consumer price, essentially. So the, the shelf price, list price, and so on. Um, then we have price pack architecture. We have promotions, um, different um, portfolios, of course, work differently in a promotion. Then we have the mix across channels. Do we want to have the same pack price architecture, for example, in, at, with all retailers, or do we want to make changes here? These are essential questions. And also, how do we set up our trade terms, trade spend across different channels? These are typically the, um, the key questions that we need to deal with. And of course, um, even so, we can look at them or list them independently. Of course, they all have, they strongly interact um, so, for example, if I change my price pack architecture and I change my uh, a price change of my product products will typically have a different effect if I, if I do that. If I change my promotions or the products I promote, uh, this will have an effect um, as well. So all of these different levers interact. They interact amongst each other. And of course, all of the changes that I make in my um, price pack architecture also affect all of my products. So if I increase or decrease the size of a product, this not only affects this product, but it affects all of the other products. And that makes this topic uh, challenging, but also very interesting. And that's what we want to look at today. We want to get started with more, I would say, the traditional way of looking at it before we then take a bit more uh, of an advanced view on the topic. And also, um, if you're wondering why we have Mario here with me, um, Mario has lots more, I would say, practical experience in the field, working very closely with our customers, and he will help us with the 
a more practical example later on. I'll first show, um, once we go through the theory, uh, show a, a simple example just to uh, highlight the effects and then Mario will lead you through a, a more realistic example just to show that this doesn't only work in the simplified world, but also in the real world. All right, so when we talk about price pack architecture, I think um, the, the name pack is, is a bit too narrow. Um, if it means that it only refers to, let's say, the size of the bottles in this example, or the number of bottles, typically we would think of it as thinking about the structure across all of these different value drivers. So when we say price pack architecture, what we mean here is that we mean the structure across brands if you're managing different brands so you're not just alpine but maybe something with b and c afterwards so we have different brands that we need to manage um, different sizes not just 1.5 liter bottle as in this example but also say 0.7 or 1 liter and so on different packs and so on so these are the different this is the playing ground essentially that we're looking at and the typical ways um, most start thinking about these topics is in something that is a abbreviation that's at least for me difficult to, to memorize, uh, OBPPC. So it means, or the, the way of looking at it is, is defining the different pack sizes that are relevant or the different products based on the occasions for which they're used. Um, then the, the different brands, maybe some more high value, some more um, cheaper brands, packages, what are the different sizes, what are the different prices, and um, how do I sell them maybe differently through different channels? Um, so you typically don't need all pack sizes um, in across all, all channels. So in this example, and this is based on, on a real case, um, corn you use for, for salad, for example, that's sold in cans here in Germany. I think the, the typical can that was always around is the 425 grams. So this is like a, maybe the size of this, this cup here of coffee um, and this is typically too large if you're just on your own and with more single households uh, a size that was introduced a couple of years ago was the much smaller the 125 view um, which makes sense if you're eating a salad or something with corn just on your own and that that essentially was um, based on, on market research and observation that it makes sense to introduce this pack and if you look at the stores uh, how present these small cans are, um, it looks like this, this was a success. And of course, if you're selling these very small sizes here, it also makes much more sense here to pack them in, in, in three packs, for example, rather than, than sell them individually, because then if you sell them individually, the, the value of each of these cans is, can be very, very low. The same thing if what has been introduced in many stores is these much larger case, um, 850 grams which is much too large if you want to cook or use everything um, as a couple, single for sure as well, but also as a family and it's something that's more used for, for parties, for example. And this is a way of looking at the different sizes that makes, of course, a natural sense. And um, there are many examples like this, for example, introducing introduction of very small uh, soda cans um, that can be used, uh, makes sense for children, for uh, if you want to mix it with alcohol or if you are, if you don't want to drink a, a full typical um, 3,300, uh, 330 milliliter cans. So there are different ways of identifying these different occasions um, in the portfolio where it makes sense to introduce a new product. And this is, I would say, the typical way many companies look at um, these challenges um, to get started. But of course, already here, um, you uh, one thing that's immediately obvious is um, maybe if you're single and um, the price difference between the large and the small can is very narrow, it might make sense for you to already go for the, for the middle uh, can in this case. So there are always, even if it's not intended or intended by this uh, OBPPC logic, to have these trade-offs between the different sizes, um, many people do actually think this way about the challenge. And therefore you have to already think about this trade-off between the different sizes. Another challenge comes from <clears throat> the fact, as we said initially, 
if you're managing, for example, different brands and you work with and without promotions, that you also need some sort of a logic across these different um, across these different mechanisms. So, for example, you have a, a brand A and you want to set up a structure, you have different sizes, 800, 400, 200, similar to the cases we, uh, we just previously had, and you're thinking about promoting them, then of course you also need to have some logic where if you promote the 800, um, does it make sense for it to be cheaper during the promotion than the unpromoted 400 price? Likewise, does it make sense to have the promoted price of a 400 gram can cheaper than the 200 if it's unpromoted? Or do you promote them all at the same time? So there are many structural effects that play an important role here. Also, do you how do you relate yourself against, for example, private labels, competitors? Do you want to allow um, to go below or do you set thresholds um, between different, different brands, for example, versus private label that are relevant? All of these considerations need to be taken into account. I would say once from a architecture or more strategic point of view, but also from a um, from a profit impact, revenue impact point of view. So how do people between, for example, choose between a promoted 400 gram cam and an unpromoted 200 gram cam? So these are different ways that, that need to be considered. Um, and typically, I would say in many cases that we see uh, teams set up a logic like this one here, where they say, okay, we have these, this is our brand, these are our competitors here, BNC, um, and we define certain rules um, of how we want to position ourselves. But what they put less emphasis on is what are the implications of that? How do people choose between a promoted brand A and an unpromoted brand B? Or how do they choose between a promoted size versus an unpromoted size within a brand? Um, one way of making sure that you maintain a certain logic um, that I find or that I've seen in many projects um, here at uh, Binomics, but also previously in my consulting life, is using something like a value driver or attribute logic like this one here, where in the ex previous example we had here with these water bottles and the different, um, the different value drivers, the bottle size, um, the pack size, the material, if it's um, recycled plastic or, or unrecycled plastic to determine a list price. And with something like this, a marked up and down logic, it's very easy to set up a consistent logic um, across the different value drivers, see where you want to price your different products. And you can also extend it. We don't have it on this slide here, but you can also extend it for, for promotions when you say, okay, I run a certain promotion and um, then I have a discount X percent, but it's it still has a had a maybe um, a threshold or guardrails uh, based on the other product logic. And that's something that's I would say very simple that can also be set up in, in Excel um, and allows the team to to re maintain the structure. And for example, across something like um, these bottle sizes or pack sizes here, you can maintain if you want a linear logic where the price per liter is always the same, or you can also um, introduce any kind of logic that you want to manage. Typically, what most will do is that if you have a price per 1000 grams, uh, maybe the, the corn cans that we had before, then typically what people expect and what <clears throat> also makes sense from a cost point of view is that you have a re diminishing or uh, reducing price um, per 1,000 gram uh, or per ounce, however you, you count it, um, as the package gets larger and you typically have something like uh, a curve like this. And it also allows you to identify um, outliers, as in this case, the 750 uh, would be a bit too expensive. If you follow this logic, that you want to, let's say, have a linear relationship here that where you have a decreasing price per thousand grams. So, and this already highlights, I think, an important problem. So this pack price architecture logic suggests that um, the 750 price should be reduced so that it's in line with this logic. It would also 
um, is, this argument would be supported by the fact that um, our sales here indicated by the bubble size for the 750 is lower than for the other two. And if we reduce the price here, we would expect that it draws some sales from the 500 and the 1000. Um, and then it would be much more uh, within the logic. However, another analysis, so we checked for price elasticities here in this case. And in this case, it, the elasticity here is very low. So minus 0.9, um, which indicates because it's between zero and minus one, if you increase the price, profit and revenue will, will always go up as long as it stays um, between zero and minus one. So in this case, the price elasticity analysis would suggest that it's better to increase the price of this product, making the problem from a pack price architecture point of view larger than before. So you already have a trade-off here, which uh, we need to understand and resolve in, in, in some way. Um, and that's actually quite difficult because this price elasticity also doesn't tell us the whole story. It doesn't tell us if we increase the price here, how does it affect the others? Um, and that makes this part of the analysis quite quite different, uh, difficult. And that's actually why um, we built the, the solution that Mario um, already indicated in the beginning. Um, and I won't go into too much detail. We, we just want to show how it works and, and what the benefit of it is. But just to give you a very brief understanding is um, what we do is um, the our solution, and this I will show how this captures the, the, the effects we want to discuss here. Um, is based on what we call virtual choppers. And the idea is to create a very large number, hundreds of thousands or millions, depending on the context of these virtual choppers. And um, each one makes individual decisions based on uh, his or her um, preferences for different product sizes, for different brands, uh, promote how they react to promotions, how they react to price thresholds, some as real people, um, are susceptible to price thresholds, some are not. So um, these virtual choppers behave collectively like real choppers. And when you show them um, it's changed in the pack pies architecture, for example, they will react to it. Um, and this shows the, um, the, the user essentially how the sales will change if you change something in the pack price architecture. Um, and typically these are created uh, from the context specific data, from survey data, from sales data, whatever's available in a, in a specific case. And once you've done that, <clears throat> we have just, um, of course, conceptual. Um, so it's easy to understand here. We have this first shopper with the utility for the different sizes uh, of a product. Then we have here these different products, 250, 500, 750 gram. We have here shoppers two, three, up to, as I said, a couple hundred thousand or a million. And now what is important is if we have here these virtual shoppers and their color indicates what product they would buy given the situation. And if we now change the size of a product here, we go, let's say from 500 grams to 450 or to 550, or we change the price, then some of them will change just like real shoppers what they would buy. Um, and here shown for the case of different different prices. This gives us these demand curves. So if we get very expensive, no one will buy a certain product anymore. Um, and when we have these different demand curves, of course, it's easy to compute revenue and profit for the different products. And of course, then it's also un easy to understand the, the total effect here. So this is just the basic mechanics. If you're interested, we have lots of material on our website um, on, on how this how this works. And if you're more interested, always open to, um, to discussing um, further details. If you reach out, very happy to do that. Um, so this allows us to really understand the dynamics if we change something in our price pack architecture. And I just want to quickly show you what that means. Uh, and Mario, if you can tell me, can you see my screen? Loading up and yes, we can see it. Perfect. So th this is the, the simplified example. Mario will show you a real example right afterwards. So here we have not cans of corn, but we have different peanuts, but of the same sizes, 100, 1,000 gram, 750, 500, 250. 
And as you can see, we can choose the different sizes here. We can um, choose the brand. So it's our own brand with different competitor brands here as well. Can could choose if we promote a product or not. Have our uh, trade terms down here. We have our costs. So everything that's relevant, we can really implement here. And then we can look at the at the outcome if we um, show this to a set of, of customers. So if, for example, if we change the price here of a product, go up 20 cent, we lose a uh, number of units, but some of them, as I said before, will choose a different product within our own portfolio. So we do not lose all of the 170, but we only uh, lose five that go to a competitor and five who will not buy anything anymore because um, they were just very close. They only had a slight preference for this large pack and now they don't want anything else. And we see that we have, because we only changed one price, we have very high elasticity here. And if we, let's say, change the closest alternative, also by 20 cent, we see that the elasticity already goes substantially uh, down, it goes from 5.5 to 3.4, 3.5. Um, and this is because the closest alternative also has become a little less um, attractive to these shoppers. But here we're not interested in price changes. I just did this to highlight how the elasticities work, how the dynamics work, but we are interested in looking at different scenarios. Um, and the one I was just looking at um, is essentially we have these four products. And now what happens is that we have a, um, sorry, that was the wrong one. We have a cost increase by 20%. Uh, and if we don't change our prices, of course, everything stays the same. We sell, sell the same units. We have the same revenue, but we have lower profit here. Um, and then now there are different things we could do. So for example, we could do um, a um, also a price increase. So we increase our prices also by 20%. We sell fewer units. Um, have about the same revenue, but it's more profitable than, of course, not increasing prices after the, the cost increase. And now we're looking at also, um, because we have now the analytic capabilities, at um, size changes. Uh, and the first one I want to look at is that we replace the 1,000 and the 750 with an 800. Um, and we see when, say, we look at units, we're selling a few more units, Compared to this case here, um, we have less revenue, we have less profit, but of course, because we can look at these different effects together, what we can also do is now look at an optimization. So we take the 800, 500, 250, and we optimize the prices for the different products. Um, and what happens then is that we um, become more profitable and actually a little bit more profitable than the case where we, where we only change the price. Um, so this is just a very ex simple example of what can be done with this type of technology. So to highlight the different effects the, that you can make changes in the products, change the sizes, and then you see also how the, the sales switch between the products. So you see here, for example, when you look at the units, um, how the sales move between the different products here. All right, and with this, as promised, I'll hand over to Mario uh, for a more realistic example. Thanks a lot, Ingo. If you could please do me the favor and also let me know once you see my screen. That yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, um, so we dove into the theoretics um, about EPA a little bit past couple of minutes. Um, what I want to show you now is how this works in an actual market environment. So um, this is a real case, anonymized, of course, and um, we can basically see the entire complexity of the market, having different brands, offering different products at different sizes um, over for example, an entire year and having also certain non-promotional and promotional periods during that year. So with all of that complexity and everything that's going on here, we would now like to simulate a certain change um, on our products. And just 
click through here real quick. And um, what we would want to simulate is changing um, this one product here from our own brand one and um, from a 1.15 liter size to a 1.25 liter size. We can apply those changes and then run the simulation. So what Ingo basically explained before is that um, our virtual shoppers, they are now taking their, their willingness to pay into consideration and calculating their utilities depending on the offer that is present in the market. And of course, um, for this new product that we just added. So here it's really always a view of the entire portfolio across all um, different retailers' channels that we're covering um, across the different segments and of course across over time. So having run that simulation, we directly see here um, the newly added product with this 1.25 liter bottle. Um, and we can immediately assess not only the impact on this one product, seeing or comparing the change here um, from before, from the 1.15 liter size, but we can also see the effect on the entirety of our own portfolio. So where people are switching from and what or which products we're basically cannibalizing and also where we are gaining from our competitors to different degrees. So this is really taking all shopper preferences into consideration and making these purchasing decisions accordingly so that we can come up with the respective KPIs in terms of demand and units sold. And then of course, also in terms of revenue generated and ultimately profit. So what we typically see with our customers is um, that then, or basically this initial simulation kicks off an entire planning process so that they are not only running this PPA simulation in isolation, but next steps would of course be changing your costs behind, right? So we increased size for this product and we would not want to stick with the same cost that we had before, but we would also want to increase our costs accordingly. And we have this new product here and a proportionate cross cost increase would roughly be 8%. If we say this additional uh, 10 milliliter in size are translating into costs immediately, um, then we are running this 8% change. And here the simulation is super fast and you can already see the impact on your profitability. So still going strong with a positive effect here, um, but of course, slightly, and devalued comparing no comparing against no cost increase. And ultimately, um, the question that, that always pops up when talking about PPA is the first P, so that's the price. Um, what are we going to do with the price? And again, we have the same capabilities here so that we can go through price change, select the respective scope, select the product that we want to change, in this case, our own, and basically adjust here either in the same way or even differentiated um, our promotional and non-promotional prices. If we do it the same way, we preserve the portfolio structure that we've seen before. If we do it differentiated, then we have to take a look or we have to watch out and that the portfolio structure remains consistent. So here in this case, run simple price increase by 5%, for example, then again, run the simulation. And the same thing that we observed before when we changed product itself is now happening from a price perspective. So the virtual shoppers are again evaluating the offers um, that are present in the market and taking their purchasing decisions here real time per period. And you see here directly what the effect in total on our own volume would be in terms of revenue, in terms of profit, both very positive cases. And we then have the opportunity to drill down even on a weekly level and assess the individual effects on this product, on our own product, um, on the cannibalized other products in the portfolio, and of course, also on all of the competitors. So with that market view, this was just, again, a simplified example running through one uh, PPA change. In reality, we, we see a lot more of those um, changes being performed. 
And I think if we go back to the slides, Ingo, then we also have another real world case with us there that I'd like to show you. Yes. There we go. Maybe maybe we do the case first and then we we go back. Yeah. So here um we have a case study with uh, one of our, our customers. And um the the questions um or the question that this customer asked is active in the food and beverage industry um was mainly around a new product introduction. So basically not only changing an existing product, but really introducing a new product that has not been seen before in the market based on a um, pack size volume change. And the main question was um, on cannibalization. So can this new product generate sufficient sales from being introduced in the market? And what's the cannibalization effect um, on the own portfolio versus um, is it actually giving us or generating us more shelf space and um, have, having us being more represented for our shoppers. And we ran through various scenarios here um, with, with our client and evaluated, I think, a couple hundred um, scenarios, a couple hundred different variations um, of those PPA changes. And ultimately, was deemed as the say most promising for actual market introduction was this case where we introduced this new product C um, generating an additional 80K of um, revenue per week, uh, which yields to, of course, a revenue increase over time then. And um, this was in total by roughly 2% on the, on the entire revenue base, which was in total then um, translated into a profit uplift of three to five percent 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 um so generally we faced a problem or a challenge here whether to introduce to widen the portfolio whether to introduce a new product um, that's potentially cannibalizing our own sales and then the question was by how much is it cannibalizing and does it make up um with the additional occasion created for the shopper and the answer here in this case was yes. So it's definitely a profitable decision to introduce this product. Perfect. Now, Let's do the yeah. don't have the poll. And then we go to one, one last learn takeaway and then to your questions. Yes, we have a last poll. Let me share it with everybody. Launch it. Okay. Now you should see the poll. Yes, we see it. So last poll here for, for today. Um, like we've seen now, now this tool um, and a couple others that Ingo also presented, um, different methods. And we were wondering um, which tools are you currently using to support your PPA activities? Of course, there can be multiple answers. In this case, um, a combination of different tools is very much possible. So we're interested in your current stack here. Yes, we're at 50% right now. Can we get it to 60? And then I can share the, the results with everybody. It's the tension. <laughs> okay. I think we're almost there, ending the poll right now and sharing the results. What do you think? That's interesting. Let me go through. We provided quite a couple of options, but um, I think the winner here with roughly with a little bit more than 50%, uh, we have price letters and then 40% Excel-based scenario simulations um, followed by market white spot analyses. And then um, we have the attribute markup markdown logic at the end. So I think, um, yeah, price ladders is, I would say, also from, from our experience, the most used tool, um, specifically when it comes to PPA, often in a combination um, with those white spot analysis. So and we basically um, draw out the price ladders and then try to identify where are white spots within our portfolio compared to competitors and also compared to, to shopper occasions. 
So that's, um, I would say also very much in line what we're seeing from the market. Um, Ingo, do you have any additional comments on this? No, just, just add on that. Um, I think it's it's what I expect. And um, the, the two things I would say that we suggested here, the mark up and downs to sort of as an extension of the price letters and uh, the, the more detailed analyses, more precise analyses that we suggest here are not as prominent in the field. Um, and maybe if we do the same poll in a year, I would hope that um, we we can be part of the switch here. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks a lot, Jonathan, for, for pulling up the poll. And then I would say let's jump two slides forward and conclude it for today before we jump into the Q&A part. Um, so what we put together is a very brief commercial checklist for PPA. And from our perspective, it's mainly two topics. First one um, being maintaining um, the respective architecture. And what we typically see as, as levers there are value drivers and their corresponding attributes on the one side. So everything around brand, size, material, volume, etc. cetera. Um, promotions on the other side, as also seen in the tool, um, we might wanna preserve the structure that we have in place today. Um, also, and then together with our, our retailing partners, um, and last but not least, the, the mix um, that we want to achieve across channels should also be in line with overall strategy and according to that architecture. And on the other side, um, I think what we typically see is more KPI related. Um, so constantly validating profit net revenue impact um, considering on the one side, shopper preferences, general preferences in the market um, that might be changing over time, specifically in high inflationary settings. Um, and then, of course, looking first within your portfolio, are there any interactions? How strong are those interactions? What's the cannibalization effect? Um, and then, of course, ideally also outside your own portfolio regarding competitors. Are you gaining market share? Are you losing market share? How can you best tackle um, the, let's say, white spots that are out there in the market to generate additional profits and revenues. And with that, I would suggest we jump over to the Q&A. Um, I think we had a couple of questions here, maybe starting with the first one from um, the Q&A part and then moving to the chat. So first question here um, is, how do you account for purchase frequency slash use up rate? when testing different sizes of product concentrations, when forecasting the volume unit impacts. Yeah, you want to answer or should I? Go ahead. I think we can just switch. Yeah, back. Uh, then, then I'll, I'll take the first one. So, the, so in, in general, with the solution, we didn't uh, go into this detail here uh, in the example, but we can also model effects over time so um, that there are some time dependencies uh, in the sense that um, if someone bought something, for example, in a promotion or if there was more sales in a promotion, then um, this leads to a reduced demand in, in the coming weeks, typically. Uh, and differences of this effect can also be considered by the solution, by, uh, depending on um, where you want to go, interpolation, extrapolation of the strengths of this effect. Nice. Yeah, thanks for, for those insights. I um, hope the question was answered. Then next one would actually be from the chat itself. Um, so first one here, does the behavioral pricing model take price knowledge and price interest into consideration? Yeah, so I, I can start and then maybe yeah. add. Um, so specifically on, on price knowledge, I think it's generally um, related to the awareness of people of the price levels that are present in the market and then making conscious decisions according um, or evaluating basically the price for the product that you intend to purchase versus the prices of all other products in the market. And um, this is something our model takes into consideration. The effect size then um, is, of course, individual per client per category segment that we're operating with, because it really depends on the um, shopper behavior in that segment. And this is something that we learn from the sales data. Yeah. 
maybe just to add from from also from my consulting experience, we we tested pricing knowledge across very many industries, and it always essentially came out that it's much lower than everyone expected. So there are some people who also like I've seen maintain or keep like a pricing book where they write down prices every week, but such people are very rare, and, and most people are surprisingly have surprisingly little knowledge uh, when you ask them directly on, on, on prices. Yeah, absolutely. Do you take one more question? I think we're already at the end of, of the time. Yeah, I would say let's take um, the last one here that popped up and then we'll make sure to reach out to answer all of the other questions. So the most recent one, um, are you using only an item price elasticity for the scenario planning functionality or are you also generating a pack size sensitivity metric as well? Ingo, you want yeah. to take? Yeah, so this, this question is very important um, and spe specifically for, for our method. Um, what, what we highlighted just very briefly, um, th there's more on this, as I said, on the website and happy to discuss in detail. The, the virtual shopper technology allows the solution with that the user to take all of this into account because you have, let's say, 100,000 of these virtual shoppers, each one equipped with different preferences for different products, brands, and so on, um, different behaviors. Um, so each one makes a decision um, and if you change the size of a product, some will switch, as we showed in the examples. Uh, if you change the price, some will switch. And from these, this behavior, you can compute, for example, a price elasticity, but you can also, in the same sense, compute, for example, a size, product size, or pack size elasticity. Um, or you can compute sort of a, a brand elasticity, knowing that it, brands are discrete, but you can compute all of these elasticities um, and the the outputs come from come from the solution, and it's based on the the behavior of these virtual shoppers. Uh, and essentially, the solution just just counts how many would buy each product given the prices and the sizes and, and other features. Awesome! Thanks a lot, Ingo. Cool. I think then we concluded for today. Um, next up. I think in three weeks, we have our next webinar on next generation pricing methods, techniques for sustainable profit growth. I'm very eager to learn more about that. And um, yeah, until then, uh, we have something to read in between. Our white paper on Gen AI for RGM. Um, if you have any questions on the topic today on PPA or also on the use of Gen AI, Please don't hesitate to reach out to, to Ingo or myself. And until then, have a nice weekend and talk soon. Talk soon. Have a good weekend. Bye.